Welcome. Today is the 1st of May, a uh, glorious first Friday here in North Idaho, and uh, this is episode 11 of the Audio Sapere interview series. So today we are joined by Hugh Owen, um, <clears throat> a researcher and director of the Colby Center for Creation. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Uh, Hugh, why don't you tell us a, just a little bit about yourself and your background for our listeners who may not be familiar with you or the Colby Center? Certainly. I'm a Welsh American. I'm a convert to the Catholic faith. My father at the time of his death was the first ever Secretary General of International Planned Parenthood Federation, but his father was a Baptist minister in Wales during the Great Welsh Revival, and uh, my father was brought up in a very devout Christian home but lost his faith at university in England where he was indoctrinated into secular humanism and evolutionism. And as a result, I was raised in a secular humanist home. We never went to church, never read the Bible, prayed, said grace or anything. And it was only um, after my father retired from the United Nations uh, after 25 years with the UN, was knighted by the Queen, and then accepted the position uh, of Secretary General of International Planned Parenthood Federation at the very time when IPPF changed its position on abortion and became the world's number one provider of abortion as well as contraception and sex education, that uh, my father unexpectedly died of a heart attack and um, that precipitated my conversion to the Catholic faith. So I was 16 years old when my father died. And uh, when I was 18 and a freshman at Princeton University, I was baptized, confirmed, and made my first Holy Communion as a Catholic at the Easter Vigil in 1972. And uh, when I became a Catholic, I wanted more than anything else to, to bring the whole world to our Lord Jesus Christ in the Catholic Church, but especially my relatives, because almost all of my relatives on both sides of the family, having been Christians of one sort or another for century after century upon century, they had all lost the faith. And what happened was I eventually came to the realization that they all, or almost all of them, believed in evolution that everything in the universe, including human beings, had evolved through the same kinds of material processes that are going on now over billions of years. And they believed this with, with religious faith. And I came to the realization that as long as they believed in this evolutionary account of the origins of man in the universe, they were not going to open up to the claims of the gospel or of the Catholic Church. And that coincided with a very important event in my life where I was running a school in New Jersey. My wife and I at that time had uh, four children, I think. And I hired a teacher to teach science in that school who did not believe in evolution. And this was a uh, a shock to me because I was led to believe when I was brought in to the Catholic Church by, by Jesuits at Princeton that evolution was perfectly acceptable for Catholics. And I'd really never had a conversation with anybody in my entire life who didn't believe in evolution. And now I had hired a teacher to teach science in my own school who not only didn't accept it, he had very good reasons for not accepting it, both theological reasons and also uh, reasons drawn from the natural sciences. And so th this was a turning point in my life because it, it ignited a desire in me to determine where the truth lay for myself. And so for the next 10 years, when I wasn't helping my wife to raise our beautiful five, then six, then seven then eight, then nine beautiful children that God has blessed us with, I researched every aspect of the creation-evolution controversy. And after about 10 years, I came to the conclusion 
that the emperor of evolution was not wearing any clothes, that in reality there was not any solid scientific evidence to support molecules to man evolution. And there was also a, a mountain of very authoritative church teaching, as well as ph philosophical argumentation that really wasn't compatible with this molecules to man evolution hypothesis. And so that was when I went on a quest to determine if there were Catholic scholars who had come to the same conclusion. And I was delighted to discover that St. Maximilian Kolbe, uh, one of my heroes, a genius in theology, philosophy, and natural science, had actually come to the same conclusion almost a hundred years ago. And that at the same time that my father was being robbed of his faith because there was nobody in his circle who could tell him the other side of the story about evolution, St. Maximilian was actually writing articles in his publications and sending them all over the world showing that evolution was bogus. So I then wanted to determine if there were Catholic scholars living today who were experts in different areas of knowledge who held to fast to the traditional teaching of the church on creation. And, and sure enough, I discovered that all over the world there were outstanding Catholic theologians, philosophers, and natural scientists who did not accept molecules to man evolution, even in the, the so-called theistic version, and who did adhere to the traditional teaching on creation. But they had no forum, because virtually every Catholic university and research center in the Western world had been taken over by people who simply accepted this evolutionary hypothesis as a fact that only a fool would deny. And as a result, there was no forum in which Catholic scholars could make the case, the overwhelming case, in favor of the traditional teaching on creation. And so that's why we founded the Kolbe Center in the Jubilee year and were incorporated on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception in the Jubilee year 2000. And, and we have been fighting ever since all over the world to show that the emperor of evolution is naked and that the traditional teaching of the church on creation is supported by all of the evidence in theology, philosophy, and natural science. Well, thank you for that introduction. That was uh, excellent. And I think I actually recall my own experience when I was first hired, um, after college, I was in Italy for a while and I came back and I got hired to teach in a diocesan school in Connecticut. And of course, I was a young, you know, creationist. I didn't know all the arguments, but I certainly was, you know, reading up and, and studying different principles in science to try to make this case stronger. So then, you know, I taught, but I, you know, I, so I taught equally a theistic view and then the, the tr a traditional view for creation. And just, just having put them, equating them, created so much debate, mostly in the faculty. The faculty was very much against it. A lot of the parents were actually happy for a change. But I didn't have a principal who was really interested in finding the truth he had already made up his mind that he knew what the truth was and he wasn't even going to question any silly crazy ideas so I, I commend you for you know when you hired the science teacher having been open to say hmm I wonder what really is going on here you know what do Catholics really think about this so still a lot of people will hear uh, what you know what you've just said that the emperor of evolution has no clothes and they're going to scratch their heads because as far as they know from media and everything else, this is a settled issue. Science has spoken. There are only only nut jobs disagree with evolution, and that's very often how it's treated in the media. So, in a nutshell, what is the argument for the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation? Why is it that science has not, in fact, settled this issue? Well, really, the the first thing we have to understand at the outset, because this is a key to clearing up most of the confusion that surrounds the origins controversy is that no human being observed the work of creation. So the only way that we can have direct knowledge of the work of creation is from the creator. 
So the traditional teaching of the church is based on the revelation of the Creator to his creatures about what he did when there was nobody else around except for the angels to observe what he was doing. And this is why God says to Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Modern scientism is based on the false premise that we can extrapolate from our very limited experience of a fallen world to explain how all of the different kinds of things in the world originated. And that is an impossibility. But as I will try to explain in the course of this interview, the reason why so many brilliant scientists and intellectuals accept evolution has much more to do, in fact, everything to do with their philosophical assumptions and very little to do with their understanding of the facts of any area of natural science. Now, the traditional teaching is based on God's revelation to us in the Holy Bible of what he did when he created the heavens and the earth and the seas and all they contain. And that revelation is then has then been interpreted by the Catholic Church, which was given full teaching authority by our Lord Jesus Christ, of course. And if we study the authoritative teachings of the popes and council fathers and the unanimous teachings of the fathers of the church and the doctors on God's revelation in Genesis about the work of creation, we find that all of it upholds the following points. Number one, God created everything by fiat. He spoke it into existence. He did not use any kind of material process like a supernova explosion or a genetic mutation, anything that is going on now in the natural order that we are living in. Big Bang. Number two. I'm sorry. No, no Big Bang. No, no Big Bang, because the Big Bang is a rather pathetic attempt to give a naturalistic explanation for the origins of the universe and the development of stars and galaxies and, and, and the solar system. Um, but we, we can come back to that and, and show uh, briefly why it's a completely failed attempt to do what can't be done. You can't give a naturalistic explanation for something that was created by God. You can only attempt to do so, but the explanation will never be satisfying because it, it simply doesn't have the capacity. There aren't the means within the order of nature to produce nature. So getting back to the traditional teaching, the first point is that God created by fiat, by willing everything, all the different kinds of creatures into existence. Secondly, he did it all at the same time, which is the teaching of the Fourth Lateran Council, re reaffirmed by First Vatican Council, where the Council Fathers defined that God created all things, visible and invisible, by his omnipotent power, in other words, not through any kind of natural process, at once from the beginning of time, simul ab initio temporis. And if you study how the greatest commentators on the Fourth Lateran Council that defined the dogma of creation, you find that they, like St. Lawrence of Brindisi, understood this to mean that God created all of the different kinds of creatures by fiat at the same time, which was compatible only with two different opinions. Number one, that God created everything in six literal days, which was the overwhelming majority view among the fathers of the church, or that he created everything instantaneously, which was the minority view of St. Augustine. 
But neither of those views entails the work of creation being spread out over long ages of time. And rightly understood, the decree on creation of the Fourth Lateran Council really excludes the possibility of creation being spread out over long ages of time, as we have demonstrated in some of uh, the writings that we have done in the last 15 years. In addition to that, the traditional teaching of the church holds that God created a perfectly complete, beautiful, and harmonious universe for us in our first parents. This is what St. Thomas in the Summa calls the first perfection of the universe, which he defines as its completeness at its first founding. Now, this means all the different kinds of creatures, the corporeal creatures and the spiritual creatures, all, each and every one perfect according to its nature, all existing together at the same time in the beginning for man, for man in our first parents, Adam and Eve. The next point that is essential to understanding the traditional teaching on creation is that God created Adam, body and soul, a special creation, and then created Eve from Adam's side, literally, a special creation, and then placed Adam and Eve as the king and queen of the entire universe, a universe that was completely free, not only from human death, but also from any kind of deformity, disease, genetic defects, birth defects, or anything of that kind. And the teaching of the traditional teaching of the church, of all the fathers and doctors, popes and council fathers in their authoritative teaching, is that when God had finished creating Adam and Eve, he stopped creating new kinds of creatures. And this is what the Sabbath commemorated, that Almighty God created a perfectly complete and beautiful universe for us. And when he had finished creating our first parents, he stopped creating. And no new kind of creature has been created from the time that God created Adam and Eve, because everything was made for us in view of the incarnation and the Immaculate Conception. And so it follows then the last point that according to the authoritative teaching of the church, it was the original sin of Adam that brought not only human death, but deformity, disease, genetic mutations, birth defects, and all these disorders into the universe. And this is why St. Paul teaches in Romans 8 that the entire universe was made subject to a bondage to decay because of the original sin of Adam. And therefore, the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ had in view not only to restore the relationship between man and God, but also to restore the entire universe back to the original beauty and harmony that it had in the beginning and indeed to bring it to an even greater perfection. That is the traditional authoritative teaching of the Catholic Church. And, and it's very beautiful and ordered. And, <clears throat> you know, it, it's, um, I, you know, I still find very compelling. But yet the other side would, you know, say, well, no, well, that, that's all bygone. We, we've already proved that all this stuff is wrong and we have the answers. So on the other side, of course, divides into two sides, both of which we'll deal with in turn. The, uh, the, the, of course, the evolutionary side, we might call it the atheistic evolution side, even though not every member of that group is necessarily an atheist, but that posits causation that does not come from a transcendent being. Essentially, that you know, it's uh, thus all your naturalistic explanations, and then the theistic side, which says, "Well, God helped the process of evolution along." So, so we'll deal with both. So, first, 
we'll look at the atheistic side, which is the world today, the media, the, the universities, including Catholic ones, unfortunately, that take the view, and they get in and they say, well, we've already settled this issue. So before we get to some of their arguments, what exactly is Darwin's theory and then its successor, of course, today, Molecules to Man Evolution, and you know, what, uh, what evidence does the other side have to verify this theory? Well, the, um, Darwin's hypothesis was an attempt to explain the origin of species of the different kinds of plants and animals through a material process rather than through special creation. And the evidence that he pointed to was, first of all, the small changes that anybody can observe in nature, for example, variations in the sizes of the beaks of finches on the Galapagos Islands, and um, extrapolation from that to the idea that these small changes over long periods of time could result in the production of new organs and new systems of the body. And of course, Darwin's speculations were based on his firm faith in the geological speculations of his colleague Charles Lyell, who believed that the fossil bearing sedimentary rocks all over the earth had been formed over long ages of time through the same kinds of slow and gradual processes that we generally observe on Earth today. So Darwin's wild speculations about biology were firmly based on Lyell's wild speculations about geology. But, and this is very important, both Darwin and Lyell's speculations were based on somebody else's assumption, which is very important to bring into the light of day. And that person, more than anybody else, was actually a Catholic, René Descartes. René Descartes was the first Catholic intellectual to be taken seriously when he argued in his discourse on method that it was more reasonable to explain the origins of things in nature like stars or plants or animals in terms of the same material processes that are going on now than by fiat creation. Now it's it's interesting as a side note to to point out that Descartes was not in fact a devout Catholic. He did go through some of the motions of being a practicing Catholic, but when he was invited by Cardinal de Berulle, a very holy prelate in France, to contribute to the restoration of the church in France, Descartes wanted no part of it. Instead, he left for the Netherlands, where he would be free to live and speak and write as he pleased. And it's a fact that he dabbled in the occult and then holed himself up in an apartment in Amsterdam or somewhere in the Netherlands, where he reported that he had three mystical dreams in which the angel of truth revealed to him a wonderful new way of thinking that would revol revolutionize the way men thought. Well, I wonder who that angel of truth might have been. But <laughs> the, uh, the fact of the matter is that one of these wonderful insights that Descartes received from the angel of truth was that it's more reasonable to explain the origins of things in nature in terms of natural processes rather than by this kind of silly idea that God just magically brought things into existence. And that is the premise that was then taken and developed by Immanuel Kant and other leading Enlightenment thinkers. And that is the idea that more than anything else carried the day with the intellectual elite in the Western world and laid the foundations for Lyell and Darwin and all their disciples down to the present day. Because once you accept the false premise that things have always been the same from the beginning 
of creation and you base your account of anything in nature on that false premise, you are always going to come to the wrong conclusions, no matter how brilliant you are and no matter how much information you may collect. Because, as we said earlier, the reality is you cannot explain nature, the origins of nature in terms of natural processes, any more than you could explain the origins of a computer by studying how the operating system works. They're two different things. So Darwin, Lyell, and all their disciples are basing their ideas on a philosophical error of profound magnitude, of great magnitude, and that has to be clearly understood. So having established that, Darwin, of course, had to find a way to explain the origins of the different kinds of plants and animals in terms of what was going on now. And the best that he could come up with was we see small variations given the long ages of geological time. Those small changes must add up to the big changes that differentiate one group of living things from another. Well, of course, that's only even plausible if the premise is true, and any Catholic ought to be able to see that the premise is false. In fact, St. Peter in Second Peter chapter 3, in one of the most amazing prophetic passages in the whole Bible, warned the church about the evolution revolution. He says scoffers will come in the latter days saying things have always been the same from the beginning of creation. And then he goes on to say, but they will have to ignore the fact that it was the word of God that brought the heavens and the earth into existence, not a material process like what's going on now. And secondly, he says that these scoffers will have to deny the fact of a universal flood in the time of Noah which completely destroyed the first created world. And sure enough, that's what Lyle and Darwin and their disciples do. They deny fiat creation, they deny the global flood, and instead they invent a wildly speculative substitute for God's revelation, which in reality doesn't measure up to the evidence at all. So getting back to the evidence, in addition to these small variations in living things that could be observed, Darwin pointed to the fossils and claimed that the fossil record showed that one kind of creature evolved into another. Reptiles evolved into birds. Land mammals evolved into whales. And something like a um, chimpanzee, uh, evolved into human beings. Now, this was based on the idea that if you could collect the fossils of similar looking creatures and arrange them in a sequence, you could make a case that that was somehow proof that the creature on the left end of the sequence somehow changed in the creature on the right. But it's really very illogical to believe that just because you can arrange skeletons in a certain order that this establishes any kind of causality. And in reality, we know now that after having explored the fossil record in <laughs> great depth, um, we have no more evidence for transitional forms between, say, reptiles and birds or land mammals and whales than we did in Darwin's day. So the, the fossil record has proven to be absolutely useless in establishing any kind of basis for molecules to man evolution. That's a phenomenal mm -hmm. point, if I could just interject, because most people are under the impression that, well, science has the fossils, they have the proof, they can show the, the transitional forms, and therefore, you know, the, this issue's already been solved, but in fact, it's not. And there was a Harvard evolutionist, 
Um, he was the author of the, the Theory of Punctuated Equilibrium. I think it was Stephen Gould. Is, is that his name? Do you, do you know yes, him? Yes, Stephen J. Gould. Right. Yes. And he had said it's the trade secret of paleontology that there are no intermediary fossils. We don't have the proof. And, and a lot of people don't know that. And this guy is an agnostic. He's not at all a Christian or any way sympathetic to any kind of uh, doctrine on creation or any uh, intelligent design or any other idea of it. So he's simply saying, well, we don't have the proof. So that thus he came up with punctuated equilibrium to try to explain why we didn't have the proof. Yes, and even Richard Dawkins has admitted recently that no up-to-date evolutionist uses the fossil record as support for molecules to man evolution. Well, um, that's nice that he's admitting that, but I don't see him launching a campaign to make sure that students in schools and universities all over the world are informed of this, because um, I think he's quite content to allow students to be indoctrinated into the completely false notion that the fossil record somehow does lend some kind of support for molecules to man evolution. But the other area or the other body of evidence that Darwin and his disciples brought forward was what they called vestigial organs. They claimed that human beings, for example, had all kinds of organs and features which were no longer functional or no longer fully functional because they had evolved at an earlier stage of evolution. And therefore, as we went on evolving and adapting, those features no longer had any usefulness. And uh, in the famous Scopes trial in 1925, where the uh, forces of, of enlightenment personified in Clarence Darrow were trying to force the ignorant Bible thumpers of Tennessee to allow their young people to be taught the enlightened view with regard to the origins of man through evolution. Some of the evidence that was deposed by experts in natural science for Clarence Darrow included the testimony of a professor from the University of Chicago who cited a German anatomist who held that there were 180 vestigial organs and features of the human body as proof that man had evolved from lower life forms over hundreds of millions of years of evolution. Well, of course, in the last 150 years since the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species, virtually every single one of these alleged vestigial organs has been proven to be fully functional. The tonsils, the appendix, and so on and so forth. And yet, if you ask the man on the street if there are organs in his body which are vestigial, which are holdovers from evolution, from an earlier stage of evolution, a very high percentage of those people are going to say yes these organs, uh, there are such things. And in fact, until very recently, at least, if you went to the Science and Nature homepage of the BBC, the most highbrow news source in the English-speaking speaking world, you will find that their Science and Nature homepage still claims that the appendix is useless, in spite of the fact that mainstream biologists have known the functionality of the appendix for at least 20 years, and it's been written up in textbooks and medical journals over that period of time. So we can, just to recap, Darwin's main evidence was small changes, which he extrapolated into big changes over long periods of time, fossils, which could be arranged into sequences that seemed to support the idea of um, molecules to man evolution, and then finally vestigial organs, which he claimed showed that the creatures existing now had descended from creatures that lived before, and that therefore these vestigial organs were holdovers from an earlier stage of evolution. Well, every single one of those 
claims has been thoroughly debunked. Hmm, fascinating. Also, something that a lot of people don't know. Now, the scientists, when presented with this, will shoot back. And they'll say, a scientific theory stands until proven wrong. It can never be proven correct. The Darwinian theory, or today more correctly, the molecules demand evolution theory, is this, they'll, they'll reject your characterization of hypothesis and, and continue to insist theory. And they'll say, well, it's withstood the test of time and thousands of scientific experiments. Nothing has disproved it since Darwin first proposed it more than 150 years ago. Indeed, many scientific advances in the range of scientific disciplines, including physics, geology, chemistry, molecular biology, etc., have supported, refined, and expanded evolutionary theory far beyond anything Darwin could have imagined. And then that, that's taken, of course, from a, a university science webpage, that, that particular <clears throat> response. And moreover, you even see um, a whole field that a number of universities have, <clears throat> excuse me, on uh, evolutionary biology, where they make the claim that most advances in modern science are based on evolutionary thought, including vaccines and other things. So, so how would you respond to that? It can, a theory can't be, it stands until proven wrong. It can never be proven correct. Well, well, the first thing that we have to do is to separate the kind of natural science that operates within its proper boundaries from the kind of pseudoscience that tries to go beyond the proper boundaries of the natural sciences. A natural scientist can operate most fruitfully within the framework provided by the Catholic Church in her traditional doctrine on creation. Why? Because anyone who works within the framework provided by the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation knows that the origins of the different kinds of creatures, including the different kinds of plants and animals and man, is to be attributed to the divine action of God. And God is not creating new kinds of creatures anymore. Therefore, it isn't the job of the natural scientist to waste his or her time trying to explain the origins of the different kinds of living things in terms of the material processes that are going on now. Therefore, he or she will spend their time fruitfully doing what natural scientists ought to do, studying the natures of things, how they relate to each other and to their environment, how they are structured. These are the kinds of things that natural scientists ought to do. And contrary to the popular mythology that the Middle Ages was some kind of dark age of natural science, it was actually a very fruitful period where the foundations were laid for every advance in natural science, medicine, and technology that has taken place in the last 1,000 years. Well, even Galileo took most of his uh, teaching on phys and physical motion and other things from 12th and 13th century monks that he that widely plagiarized. Uh, absolutely. I mean, and and there was very much um, a a kind of a community of academics because of the fact that the church provided a universal um, forum and a common language, Latin, including a technical vocabulary that could be used by natural scientists who were anywhere in Christendom. Um, and of course, the Protestant Revolution didn't completely destroy that, but it did severe harm to it and, and greatly retarded the progress of natural science and medicine for that reason. But getting back to the, the claims of the modern scientists, the first thing you have to understand then is that because they make the totally unprovable assumption or unverifiable assumption that things have always been the same from the beginning of the universe, as Carl Sagan used to say, this is cosmos, this is all that was, that is, or ever will be. Well, that's a statement of faith. That's not a scientific observation. It's not self-evident. It's a pure act of faith. So if the modern scientists are going to make this pure act of faith 
in naturalism, then of course the only science, the only scientific explanation for the origins of anything in nature is going to have to be in terms of the material processes that are going on now. But you see, that's not science. That's philosophy, very bad philosophy, being used to define science in a way which is anti-science. Let me give you an example. If you uh, try to explain the origins of a star naturalistically, you have to be able to posit things that have never been observed and you have to posit that matter, gas in particular, behaved in a way that we don't observe it to behave in the real world. And when you put brilliant people to work coming up with naturalistic explanations for the formation of stars and galaxies, all you get is a terrible waste of time, talent, and resources. Whereas if you simply accept what God revealed, that he created the stars in the beginning, you don't waste time trying to explain something that isn't really within your power to explain. And instead, you can use that time and your resources fruitfully, maybe to study the natures of stars, how they interact with their environment and other things of that nature. Now, what the modern scientists claim is that with the new technology and the new discoveries that it has made possible, molecules to man evolution has been thoroughly established. Well, the reality is exactly the opposite. As St. Maximilian Kolbe pointed out, the more natural scientists learn about any part of the natural world, the more it contradicts the claims of molecules to man evolution. For example, when DNA was discovered in 1953, the evolutionists set to work to show how this uh, DNA that could be found in all different kinds of plants and animals was proof that all living things descended from some primordial blob over hundreds of millions of years. And their argument was, well, look, all living things contain this same genetic code. This is obvious proof that they must all have descended from some common ancestor. Well, that's very, very poor logic because anybody knows that that's not the only explanation for finding the same kind of code in many different kinds of creatures. An equally logical and in the end far superior explanation is that the same designer, the same creator, the same encoder used that code when he created the different kinds of creatures. And indeed, that's what cutting edge genetics tells us. Cutting edge genetics, as beautifully summarized by Dr. John Sanford, PhD in plant genetics at Cornell University, cutting edge genetics tells us that the human genome, for example, is degrading and uh, that mutations are destroying the architecture of the human genome steadily over time, and that all the evidence points to the reality that the human genome must have been created in a state of perfection or near perfection not that long ago, and that ever since that original state of perfection, it has been degrading steadily to the point where leading mainstream geneticists are wondering how the human race can really survive more than a few thousand years more because at the rate we're accumulating genetic mutations, we are headed for error catastrophe and complete genetic meltdown. Now, this supports God's revelation that he created man perfect in the beginning and that with the original sin, decay entered into the order of nature. This is what we see. We see that 
Adam and the early patriarchs could live to be seven, eight, nine hundred years because they had virtually no genetic load. But we find that over time, um, the environment gets degraded, especially at the time of the flood, and more and more genetic mutations enter in to the gene pool, especially when, at the time of the flood, the entire human race is reduced to the eight members of Noah's family, so that all of the genetic defects in those individuals are now part of the gene pool for all of their descendants forever, because everyone listening to this program is descended from one of the three sons of Noah. And so when we look at what can actually be observed, we find that it fits perfectly with the data provided by Moses in Genesis 1 to 11 in God's revelation. And it completely contradicts the claims of the evolutionary hypothesis. Why? Because according to the neo-Darwinian hypothesis that is being rammed down the throats of students in schools and universities all over the world, including most Catholic schools and universities, it's through mutation and natural selection that evolution has taken place, that new organs have been produced, that new systems of the body have come into existence. And yet this flies in the face of the evidence. Because what the evidence tells us is mutations are like bugs in a computer program. They destroy the architecture of the genome. They introduce dysfunction. There is not one single example of a mutation or a group of mutations that has produced a new function that was not already present in the genome of a plant or animal. There, are, there have been attempts made to point to things like Lenski's E. coli uh, experiments, but if you scrutinize the claims, you find that what are actually put forward as examples of functional information adding mutations are nothing of the kind. And yet, if the neo-Darwinian account of evolution is true, we should be able to find literally billions of examples of mutations that are adding new functional information to the genomes of plants and animals every day of the week. So the bottom line is just to take the one field of genetics, cutting edge 21st century genetics as meticulously documented by Dr. Sanford in his book, Genetic Entropy, cutting edge 21st century genetics proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that mutation and natural selection cannot even produce one new organ, much less all of the different kinds of plant and animal life that we see on earth today. Whereas the biblical revelation, God's revelation as understood in the Catholic Church from the beginning agrees perfectly with all of the evidence in genetics. We have God creating the different kinds of creatures perfect in the beginning. We have the bondage to decay beginning with the original sin and we see then mutation beginning to break down that perfect genomic architecture that God created in the beginning. That's what we see. God's revelation agrees with what real science sees in nature in the laboratory. Biological evolution contradicts the evidence. Now, the evolutionary biologists will shoot back and they'll say, well, wait a minute, bacteria colonies build up resistance to antibiotics through evolution. It is important to note that in every colony of bacteria that there's a tiny few individuals which are naturally resistant to certain antibiotics. This is because of the random nature of mutations. So with is this is so with bacteria. Why do you know why wouldn't mutation also solve these questions in single cell you know how single celled organisms developed into human beings. So you have the bacteria they resist the the antibiotics and then those ones survive and pass on their traits to you know the, the next bacteria they produce. So it would appear to the evolutionary biologist that this is a proof for, you know, for evolution. Well, of course, it's nothing of the kind. And there are really two 
points that need to be understood. First of all, when certain bacteria have resistance to an antibiotic, in many cases it's simply because those bacteria already existed in the population and while the antibiotic is able to kill off most of the bacteria, the ones that already have the resistance are able to survive and multiply. So there's no evolution going on in those cases. And what's more, it has been demonstrated many, many, many times. Uh, there's a, a, a microbiologist named Minich who's written about this very well, which show that even in those cases, if you remove the antibiotic from the scene, the bacteria that were wiped out by the antibiotic will often come back and predominate because they were actually more robust to begin with. And the only reason why the other bacteria predominate in the presence of the antibiotic is usually because they, there's something wrong with them that makes them less susceptible. They don't interact with the antibiotic in the same way as the healthier bacteria, and that's why they survive. Now, in other cases, you'll have bacteria that do mutate in such a way that they're, the antibiotic is not able to be effective against them. But when you examine closely what's actually going on, it's, it's virtually always the case that the mutation is actually breaking something. It's not making something new. It's not making giving the bacteria some new functionality that allows it to triumph over this antibiotic. It's that something is broken, which gives that bacteria the short-term benefit of not being wiped out by the antibiotic. But in no way, shape, or form is that mutation making the bacterium more survivable or robust in the long term. And this is true of all the so-called beneficial mutations. Take, for example, the sickle cell mutation, which I was taught as an example of evolution in action at one of the quote-unquote best schools in the United States. Well, there you have a mutation which deforms hemoglobin, which obviously is necessary for transporting oxygen to all the cells of your body. And it's true that when the malaria parasite um, is confronted with the deformed hemoglobin, um, the, the result is that the person with the deformed hemoglobin is much less likely to die of malaria. But having deformed hemoglobin or even having the, the gene for that defect is not a step on the way to becoming Superman. It's a case of breaking something which gives you a short-term advantage. It's not a case of making something new that gives you an advantage that makes you more likely to survive or makes you more robust and able to survive in the environment where you find yourself. And all of the examples in the textbooks are of this type. So no, antibiotic resistance, the sickle cell mutation, the E. coli mutations, none of these demonstrate new functional information being added to the genome of any type of plant or animal, and that is what biological evolution requires. Utterly fascinating. Now, one of the features of it, Pro, a proper theory in, uh, in natural sciences is falsifiability. You have to you know, show under what conditions your, your thesis will be you know, disproven. And Darwin does this in Origin of Species with the, you know, the concept of irreducible complexity. If something's irreducibly complex, that would shoot his theory of natural selection down, and presumably the modern theory of uh, you know, mutation in place of natural selection. So Darwin postulates, of course, one of the problems that would have to be explained was the eye, because the eye, for example, was something irreducibly complex. And I, researcher uh, Michael Behe, you know, who's an intelligent design theorist, I can't remember if it's in his film Darwin's Black Box or in another film, where he argues for this very irreducible complexity of the eye. 
right? Something that you, you just cannot be explained by natural evolution because it's got thousands upon thousands of nerves. It's, it's irreducibly complex, it would seem. Yet today, the scientists try to explain that as well. And they say, well, the evolution of the eye has actually been very studied and we can more or less establish its history. First, they say, there were light sensitive cells which merely indicated which way the sun was. A slight indentation made a sense of direction possible. Mucus in the pit focused the light. And so if the mucus hardened, then you have a proper lens and so on and so forth. In fact, every stage of the eye's development is still around on earth today. A snail's eye is less than half a human eye, yet it serves the snail well enough to help its survival. Okay. So you know, a lot of scientists believe that would answer Behe's challenge on irreducible complexity. Would you agree with that? Absolutely not. And I don't believe that Michael Behe's argument has ever been refuted by any of the people like Dr. Ken Miller, for example, who claim to have refuted it. I mean, it's, it's almost embarrassing to recall um, the claim by Dr. Ken Miller that he could create a mouse trap step by step and showing that you know first he would take one part and he would find this function for it and then add another part and he would find a different function for it until finally he ended up with a complete mouse trap and he claimed that that was some kind of refutation of Michael Behe's irreducible complexity well it was nothing of the kind I mean in the first place Dr. Ken Miller has a God-given intelligence, and he was using that God-given intelligence to find a function for these different parts that could be assembled into a mousetrap. How that's proof of a naturalistic process of evolution that builds something like a human eye is beyond me, because the whole point of the naturalistic version of evolution is that this is all supposed to happen without any guiding intelligence. Um, but in addition to that, the, the reality is that the different kinds of eyes that we find in nature are not half a human eye or a quarter of a human eye. They are perfect eyes for the creatures that have them. Now, there are exceptions, creatures that have been uh, subject to mutations which have destroyed the original uh, functionality that they had when the original prototype was created. But those are exceptions. The eyes that we find in nature, generally spe speaking, are perfect for the creatures that have them. So it's completely misleading and false to claim that a snail has half a human eye. A snail has 100% of the eye that it needs to, to, to survive in its niche in the ecosystem. And the human eye is perfect for the human being. And the complexity of the human eye is beyond our comprehension. And the notion that anything so complex and so interrelated with the brain, that this could have originated through some kind of material process is simply incredible. And we haven't a single example, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, of one single new function appearing through the process of mutation and natural selection. So on what grounds could anybody credibly claim that something that would have required millions of functional mutations has ever happened? If you can't demonstrate one, how can you make a plausible claim that something that would have involved thousands or millions of functional coordinated mutations has taken place? It's totally absurd, and it's an insult to the intelligence of the public. Whereas, what God has revealed fits once again with the evidence. God has told us that he created all the different kinds of creatures, and we know that the prophet Isaiah predicted that one of the signs that God was walking the earth, that the Messiah had come to the earth, is that he would give sight to the blind. Because it is a fact 
that before our Lord Jesus Christ walked the earth, no one, no man in all of human history had ever given sight to the blind. And when our Lord Jesus Christ gave sight to the blind, he had to work two incredible miracles. And this is why in one instance, he deliberately touched a man and who was blind, and the man said, I see something like trees walking around. In other words, the man wasn't able to process what he was seeing. And so Jesus touched him again, and then the man was able to see perfectly. Why did our Lord do this? To prove to our skeptical generation, perhaps, that he knew perfectly well that there were two different miracles involved in giving anyone the faculty of sight and the use of that faculty. Number one, the hardware had to be fixed. So if there was something wrong with the optic nerve or with any part of the eye, God, Jesus Christ, had to fix that by his divine power. But the second miracle was that he had to instantaneously program the nervous system of that person to be able to use his eyes to see. It's very well known that when surgeons restore sight to people, they oftentimes have a kind of a nervous breakdown because they're not able to process the information. So our Lord Jesus Christ, to complete the miracle of the restoration of sight, had to not only fix the hardware, he also had to program the brain and the nervous system instantaneously to be able to use that hardware to see. And when he did it, he did it in a split second. And this tells us God created the eye in the same way in the beginning. The character of God doesn't change. When Jesus Christ walked the earth, when he gave sight to the blind, in a split second he did it. When he raised the dead, in a split second he did it. And so in the beginning, he acted in the same way. He spoke and it was made. He commanded and it stood, for, stood forth. And he made each kind of creature perfect according to its nature from the beginning. Hmm. Now, it's a lot of people will stop and say, well, what about dinosaurs? They, they lived 55 million, billion something years ago. And well, science has proven it through carbon dating and other things. So how can you believe in a young Earth creation? Did humans and dinosaurs live together? Again, we, we, we have to keep reminding ourselves that all the different forms of evolutionary speculation, whether they be atheistic or theistic, are all based on the faith, on faith in Descartes' unverifiable assumption that things have always been the same and that everything can be explained, the origins of everything can be explained in terms of the same material processes that are going on now. You cannot forget this. And when you get into discussions with people who hold to evolutionary views, you have to bring this to their attention. You have to be like Socrates. You have to show people the assumptions that they've made that they're not even aware of, which are actually determining their whole worldview. So, because the overwhelming majority of the intellectual elite, both within Catholic institutions and non-Catholic institutions, have put their faith in Descartes' unverifiable assumption that there's a naturalistic explanation for the origins of just about everything, therefore, they have to then accept that there is a naturalistic explanation for the origins of the different kinds of plants and animals. And that requires time, lots and lots of time, so that the small changes that can actually be observed in the laboratory and the real world can be believed, at least, to add up to the big changes that would be necessary to make reptiles change into birds or land mammals into whales. And so what people need to understand is before there was any such thing as radiometric dating, 
the time scale that we have today was already in place. Let me repeat that. Before there was any such thing as radiometric dating, the time scale that is in the textbooks today had already been put in place. So when radiometric dating was invented, the results were automatically calibrated to fit within the framework that had been developed by Charles Lyell and Darwin and their disciples that required that there be millions and millions of years between dinosaurs and the age of reptiles and the evolution of man. So having got that clear, the second thing we need to understand is that radiometric dating itself is not a reliable scientific practice or discipline. Radiometric dating is based on three unverifiable assumptions, which we know are invalid in many, if not most cases. For those who may not be familiar with the process, radiometric dating is based on the idea that if you have a rock and you find in that rock, let's say, a certain amount of uranium and a certain amount of lead that is produced by uranium breaking down into lead over a long period of time, then you can make a calculation of how long it would take for uranium to break down into the amount of lead that you find in the rock, and you can then claim that based on that calculation, you have been able to determine when the rock originally formed. And this is the kind of evidence which is cited to our, our young people uh, as proof that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old and that the, the universe itself is 13.8 billion years old because of the various rocks that have been analyzed and the, the uh, samples that have been tested in this, in this way. But of course, there's more to it than meets the eye, because here are the three assumptions which are almost never disclosed to students in the classroom. Number one, let's take the rock, the hypothetical rock that we just mentioned, that contains a certain amount of uranium and a certain amount of lead. In order to be able to say that we know how long ago the rock was formed based on the amount of uranium and lead that we find in the sample, the first thing we have to assume is that we know what the initial conditions were when the rock was formed. How can we know those? Can we get in a time machine and go back a thousand years, a hundred thousand years, a million years, a billion years? No, we cannot. There is absolutely no way that we can be certain that we know what were the initial conditions when the rock formed, how much uranium was actually in the rock at the time that it solidified. We have no way of being certain of that. Assumption number two. Assumption number two is that the rate of decay, the rate at which uranium breaks down into lead, has been constant over the whole history of the earth. That is, again, an unverifiable assumption. We cannot go back in a time machine and measure the rate of radioactive decay over the whole history of the earth. It is a pure assumption that the rate of decay has always remained the same. And we know that there is abundant evidence that the rate of radioactive decay accelerated at some point in the past. We don't have time to get into a lot of detail about this, but I'm happy to provide detailed information to people who are interested. But just very briefly, I'll cite one very striking body of evidence. We know that in the granite basement rocks all over the Earth, there are zircon crystals that contain helium that is the result of radioactive decay and specifically, in many cases, of uranium breaking down into lead, which is a process that involves eight different stages. And 
as these eight different stages of radioactive decay take place, helium atoms are produced, which get trapped in these zircon crystals. Now, we know that the amount of helium that has been produced and that is trapped in these zircon crystals would testify to over a billion years worth of decay from uranium into lead according to the rate of decay that we observe today in nature and in the laboratory. But here's the rub. In these zircon crystals, scientists have done meticulous experiments and observations and have determined that the amount of helium that is retained in the zircon crystals is not compatible with the billion year time frame because helium diffuses out of these crystals at a rate which has been very carefully measured and tested and the amount of helium that has been retained in the zircons is only consistent with them having been uh, filled with helium perhaps 6,000 to 10,000 years ago at the outside. So there's a contradiction between the radiometric dating result based on the assumptions that I've been talking about and the simple fact that the amount of helium that has been retained in these zircon crystals is not compatible with that age, but is compatible with the chronology that is provided by the Bible. Now, the third assumption is that the rock which contains the uranium and the lead is a closed, has been a closed system throughout the history of the rock. But this again is an unverifiable assumption and in many cases we can be sure that it's also a false assumption. Why? Well, uranium is water soluble. It is very easy to imagine scenarios where uranium could be leached out of the sample or water could flood an area, uranium could be brought in and the, the uh, sample could be uh, contaminated. There is absolutely no way to guarantee that this rock has been a closed system throughout its history. And therefore, the results of this uh, radiometric dating are completely unreliable. Now, somebody may say, well, that's, that's kind of uh, arrogant for you to say. If, if all you have are these kind of theoretical principles to work from. But that's not all that we have. There are many, many cases that are in the scientific literature where rocks of known age have been tested in world-class laboratories with all different kinds of radiometric dating methods, argon to argon, uranium to lead, rubidium strontium, you name it. And these tests give ages of millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years to rocks which are known to have formed within the last 20 years, 100 years, 200 years. So we know that any practice in natural science which produces results which are so discordant with known facts should be discarded. And if this practice were not being used to bolster the bankrupt evolutionary hypothesis, it would have been discarded long ago. But because the mainstream science community is desperate to prop up the rotten edifice of molecules to man evolution with anything that they can find, they continue to use this radiometric uh, dating uh, as a way of bolstering it, at least in the public mind. But for the reasons that I've given, it's totally bogus. But that's not all. When it comes to dinosaurs, there is overwhelming positive evidence for dinosaur and human coexistence. And I'll just mention three different bodies of evidence. First of all, in recent years, in peer-reviewed scientific journals, there have been quite a few 
documented cases where soft tissue and even intact strands of DNA and other biomolecules have been found in the remains of dinosaurs. Now, DNA has a half-life in laboratory conditions of 521 years. That means that after 521 years, in ideal conditions, a strand of DNA will be 50% broken up. This means that after five to 10,000 years, the DNA will be so degraded that it will be impossible to really find any intact strands. How is it then that in the remains of dinosaurs, which supposedly became extinct 65 million years ago, we find intact strands of DNA? Why do we find, for example, in a T-Rex, soft tissue and blood vessels? How do we find these kinds of biological structures intact when we know from our experience of the real world in nature and in the laboratory, these kinds of structures cannot survive for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, much less millions of years. This evidence ought to be sufficient to prove that the whole geological time scale that molecules to man evolution depends on is bogus. But that's not all. Carbon-14 is the only radiometric dating method that has some reliability because Walter Libby, the inventor of the method, was able to calibrate his results with objects of known age. And this is because carbon-14 has a relatively short half-life, 5,300 and 5,000 730 years, I think it is. Um, I might have gotten the three and the seven <laughs> mixed up, sorry. But anyway, it's between five and 6,000 years, the half-life of carbon-14. Now, carbon-14 is formed in the atmosphere where cosmic rays come in and nitrogen-14 gets changed into carbon-14. And um, in the uh, present uh, atmosphere, there's approximately one atom of carbon-14 for every trillion atoms of carbon-12. So in every living thing, plant, animal, human being, we all contain carbon. And while a, a plant or animal is alive, the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 stays the same, about one to a trillion. But when a plant or animal dies, the carbon-14 begins to break down into nitrogen-14. So the ratio changes. And this is the basis for carbon-14 dating. But because carbon-14 has a relatively short half-life, Libby was able to calibrate his results by taking objects of known age, like pieces of wood, say, from the tomb of an Egyptian pharaoh. And he could use that to calibrate the results. As a result, carbon-14 actually has some usefulness for dating things that are only a few thousand years old. Now, if the conventional molecules to man evolution mythology were true and dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago, then there should not be one single atom of carbon-14 left in any dinosaur bone anywhere on Earth. Because with a half-life of 5,730 years, after 57 to 110,000 years or so, every single atom of carbon-14 will have broken down into nitrogen-14. There won't be any left. But in papers that my scientific colleagues have presented at world-class uh, geoscience conferences, we have presented the results of numerous tests that were done with accelerated mass spectrometers in world-class laboratories, proving that carbon-14 has been found in dinosaur bones, many different locations, 
and in the same amounts as we find in the bones of wolves and bison and other creatures that we know have lived together with human beings on Earth. And, of course, the evolutionists claim contamination and uh, all kinds of things, but their objections simply don't hold up to scrutiny because the samples have been handled very properly, uh, the proper chemicals have been re used to remove any kind of contaminant from the samples. The laboratories were not told what they were dating, obviously, or they would have returned the samples to the scientists. And yet, consistently, in over 20 different instances at this point, significant amounts of carbon-14 have been found in dinosaur bones from all over the world. So, the straightforward honest scientific conclusion is that these dinosaurs lived thousands of years ago, not millions of years ago. And that is consistent with God's revelation as it has been understood in the church from the beginning. In fact, in the book of Job, God describes to Job two different kinds of dinosaurs, Leviathan and Behemoth. Now the footnotes in modern Bibles will tell students, young people, that behemoth is a Colombian mammoth or a hippopotamus. But if you compare the description of behemoth to a Colombian mammoth or a hippopotamus, it's, it's an insult to the student's intelligence. Whereas if you compare behemoth to a brachiosaurus or other sauropod dinosaur, the description fits perfectly. And that brings me to the third body of evidence that demonstrates beyond any reasonable doubt that humans and dinosaurs have lived together on Earth recently, meaning in the last few thousand years. And I am referring to all the artwork, sculpture, cave paintings, um, and narratives which perfectly describe different kinds of dinosaurs which have been recorded and handed down by many different groups of people all over the earth for thousands of years. On the Kobe website, we have an article by uh, a wonderful young Catholic uh, homeschooled uh, young man, Garrett Dupre, on evidence for dinosaur and human coexistence, where people in the audience can examine some of this wonderful evidence. And... Um, it's very difficult to explain how different groups of people all over the earth could produce these anatomically perfect descriptions and portrayals of different kinds of dinosaurs if they didn't actually see them and encounter them in real life. And before leaving this topic, I'd like to share with the audience the two different hypotheses that the evolutionist community has come up with to try to explain away this evidence. Sure. Because I think, I think it's very interesting to see what, what is the best explanation they've been able to come up with and just how terrible it is. The first explanation was offered by Carl Sagan. And uh, Carl Sagan couldn't deny that there were accurate drawings and depictions of dinosaurs all over the world. So he explained it this way. He said that we are all descended from reptiles and therefore we have a genetic memory of the age of reptiles. And so what's happening when people in Mexico or in South America made a realistic sculpture or depiction of a dinosaur is that that genetic memory was coming to the surface and this is why the people made this sculpture or this depiction or gave this accurate narrative describing a dinosaur. That's hypothesis number one. Hypothesis number two was actually presented to us by a religious sister at a seminar we presented on the traditional doctrine of creation and her claim was that these places where 
we find realistic drawings and depictions or accounts of dinosaurs happen also to be places where dinosaur bones can be found. And that the reason that, for example, the American Indians in the Southwest had a realistic depiction of a Brachiosaurus long-necked dinosaur type was because they had seen the bones of these dinosaurs and they reconstructed the creature in their minds from the bones. Well, let's take a closer look at these two scientific explanations of the evidence by the evolutionist community. First, Carl Sagan. If Carl Sagan's hypothesis is true, since every single human being who has lived on Earth for the last 2,000 years is descended from a reptile, then it follows that every single human being on Earth over that entire period carried the genetic memory of the age of reptiles. Okay, so now if that's true, we should find in the literature of the 17th and 18th centuries before paleontology began, before we started to have reconstructions of dinosaur skeletons and natural history museums, we should find examples in literature of people who woke up in the middle of the night in Paris or London or Boston and had a vivid dream of a sauropod and made a painting or a sculpture of it. Because if Carl Sagan's hypothesis is true, every single one of the people who lived in the 17th and 18th century was closer to the age of the reptiles and therefore should have had, if anything, a more vivid genetic memory of the reptile period than the people who came after them in the 19th and 20th centuries. Well, what do we find? Of course, we don't find one single example of anybody in Paris, London, Rome, Boston, or anywhere else in the world for that matter, waking up in the middle of the night with a vivid dream about a sauropod. We don't have any example of anybody making a painting or an accurate sculpture of a dinosaur during this period of time. So the hypothesis fails because if the hypothesis were valid, then we ought to find some kind of even distribution of these dinosaur memories spread throughout human history and among human populations, and we don't find anything of the kind. So let's move on to hypothesis. Well, sure, stuff. although one might argue dragons, for instance. But the dragons, you see, um, when you study the narratives, you find that the dragons were dinosaurs and that the people who described the encounters with dragons originally were not remembering something from a forgotten past. They either were recounting an actual encounter with a dinosaur, as in the case of Beowulf, for example, or they were remembering the account of an encounter with a dinosaur that was handed down to them by their ancestors. But that is something totally different from Carl Sagan's purported genetic memory. Right. Because right. if it is in fact a genetic memory, then we ought to be able to find examples of people who have absolutely no connection to any kind of oral tradition or literary tradition that can be traced back to an actual historical encounter with a dragon, let's say. And yet we should be able to find examples of people who still dredge up that genetic memory from their unconscious. And we don't find one single example of that kind that I know of. Um, so let's move on to hypothesis number two, that the Indians and other ancient people found bones of dinosaurs and this is why they were able to make these accurate depictions. Well, I think the obvious rejoinder to that is we do not have any examples in history of explorers or missionaries coming into areas where ancient people had created these realistic depictions of dinosaurs 
and finding that they had assembled the skeleton of a stegosaurus inside of one of their huts. We don't have this. All we know is that the bones of these creatures may have been deposited in a broken fashion in the environment. But how do you get from having a jumbled assemble of bones to a very realistic depiction of the actual creature with all of its parts and its skin and every, its scales and everything else? Uh, it simply doesn't make sense. And what is more, there are instances where the depiction of the ancient people was more accurate anatomically than the most up-to-date paleontological exhibits in the world at the time that scientists and archaeologists began to examine these samples. For example, in Akambaro, the iguanodon is shown uh, in the sculpture with the tail being carried aloft. And my understanding is that in the early days, before complete skeletons had been found, uh, paleontological exhibits in reputable natural history museums would show the tail being dragged on the ground. So here's an instance where the ancient people had been able to reconstruct the correct anatomy of a creature, which brilliant scientists had not been able to correct, had not been able to assemble correctly from the bones that they had found. If that's true, how can we explain how ancient people, without even reassembling the bones into a whole creature, could possibly have made anatomically correct drawings and sculptures of them? So I think it's fairly obvious that the most straightforward, logical, sensible, and indeed scientific explanation of the data is that humans and dinosaurs have lived together on Earth in recent times, in the last few thousand years, which is exactly what we would expect based on God's revelation to Moses and God's detailed references to at least two different kinds of dinosaurs in the book of Job. <clears throat> mm, utterly fascinating and interesting at every level. Now, no scientific theory is without its social consequences. And they don't develop in vacuum, as you noted on the um, on the, the the natural science side. You have precursors to Darwin in um, Descartes and Lyell, but on the social side, you have a precursor in Thomas Malthus, who, if I'm not mistaken, Darwin is a distant relation of. I might be mistaken on that, but nevertheless, Malthus looks at the the problem of the industrial revolution, and there's so many destitute poor without even the means to feed themselves. And this, this is a huge problem, of course, for the wealthy aristocracy in London and elsewhere in England. So they say, so Malthus says, well, it's simple. The world's overpopulated. There, there's too few resources for too many people. So we need to get rid of people. And thus he postulates, oh, yeah, we need these great plagues to come and wipe out all these extra people. Well, Darwin was also fascinated by this. So he postulated that, well, they're simply not evolved enough, and then continued that as he, he developed his, his the hypothesis of natural selection. These guys aren't evolved enough. Uh, Galton, Darwin's half-cousin, puts this in, into this social phenomenon into his own science, which he calls eugenics, good genes. These people aren't evolved enough, therefore they're not smart enough to command the resources to to work you know, and uh, you know, amass the wealth to be at leisure like Galton, who had a natural fortune and could do whatever he wanted. So what is the legacy of evolution in, in, in eugenics, of course, which comes straight from evolution in the 19th and 20th century? Well, faith in evolution is absolutely the foundation of the anti-culture of death. If you look at message of Our Lady of Fatima, she warned that if her requests were not heeded and if mankind did not repent and turn back to God, that Russia would spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. And what many Catholics do not realize is that the principal error that took hold in Russia in 1917 was not communism. It was evolutionism. Evolutionism is what changed Lenin 
from somebody who had been brought up or at least baptized, chrismated, and communed as an Orthodox Christian into an atheist. It is also what robbed Stalin of his faith. Uh, when he read Lyle and Darwin in his monastic seminary, he became an atheist. And evolution justified their atheist materialism in their minds and therefore was the foundation for their materialistic communism and ultimately the justification for their being directly or indirectly responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of human beings because those human beings inconveniently stood in the way of evolutionary progress. Now, the Blessed Mother said that the errors would spread, and they did. And, and uh, we find that in uh, China, which was um, support, the communists in China were mainly sponsored by the communists in the Soviet Union, that when the communists took over in each place, they would indoctrinate the people first and foremost into evolution. And this was documented by Bishop Olgara, who was a passionist missionary bishop in China. He saw this happen in his diocese in China, that the first lesson that had to be ran in, down the throats of the people was, you are a product of evolution. You are the result of a material process. You have no soul. There is no God. There is no afterlife. Because on that foundation, the people could be made receptive to the communist ideology. This was also the foundation for Nazism. Hitler had the support of the overwhelming majority of the German intellectual elite, the same elite that, uh, uh, elite that supported the German military when they went into Namibia and practically wiped out whole tribes of African people because they were seen as missing links, subhuman, less evolved entities that could simply be hunted down like animals and wiped off the face of the earth. And so the intellectual elite in Germany, like much of the intellectual elite here in the United States, supported the Nazi eugenics program, supported the experiments on human subjects in the concentration camps. Because people like Mengele, when they performed experiments on living human subjects in Auschwitz, thought that they were just doing evolution in the lab. If they took a less evolved human like a gypsy or a pole and did experiments, say, to see how long it would take them to freeze to death in freezing cold water, they could use that valuable data to help the more highly evolved Aryan Luftwaffe pilot so that when he was shot down over the North Sea, you know, maybe they could help him to survive until help arrived. So there was nothing wrong with that. That was just doing evolution in the lab. The same thing that nature was doing on a big scale, they were doing scientifically in the laboratory of the concentration camp. And, of course, we like to think that we are different from the Nazis and different from, from Lenin and Stalin and Mao Zedong, but we're not different at all. Our people have become very comfortable with the same underlying philosophy that produced the abominations of Nazi Germany and communist China and communist Soviet Russia. For example, Barack Obama appointed as the head of the National Institute of Health a born-again Christian, Francis Collins. And Francis Collins, while he never hesitates to profess that he is a born-again Christian, also is not ashamed to say that he is fully in favor of embryonic stem cell research. Now, not coincidentally, Francis Collins is also one of the founders of BioLogos, a very well-funded think tank that gives millions of dollars mainly to or largely to Christian and even Catholic institutions to promote theistic evolution, the reconciliation of Christianity with molecules to man evolution. And so it's no surprise that Francis Collins has been desensitized and lost the proper reverence that he should have for the human being from the moment of conception. 
And therefore, he's quite willing as a born again Christian to use our tax dollars to take little tiny boys and girls, tear them to pieces and use the spare parts and the experiments on them to benefit stronger, less vulnerable human beings. How is that ethically any different than what Mengele did in Auschwitz? But you see, it all flows out of the same rotten evolutionary philosophy. And that evolutionary philosophy is the foundation of the anti-culture of death that is taking over this world. That's a really important point. And of course, uh, Margaret Sanger, the founder of uh, Planned Parenthood, which was originally the Birth Control League, um, she was a diehard eugenicist, highly influenced by Galton. She used to publish articles by Mengele and, and other Nazi scientists in the Birth Control Review, her magazine. And there, there others uh, were committed to that same philosophy. And I think it was Engels when he eulogized on Marx. I have it in my copy of the Marx Engels Reader. When he eulogized Marx, I'll quote it in the episode notes, I'll type it up. He said that there could be no Karl Marx without a Charles Darwin. And I find well, that utterly fascinating. Certainly, um, Marx recognized that Darwin's hypothesis provided the scientific justification for materialism in the realm of nature just as his hypothesis provided a justification for materialism in the realm of economics and sociology and politics and so he saw that in that sense Darwin's work was more fundamental than his own it was the foundation really for everything that Marx and Engels were writing and everything that they were trying to do. Now, of course, uh, the fellow you mentioned that Obama pointed, he's not the only one highly influenced by, by evolution. In fact, today there's many Catholics, and probably the vast majority, who have said, well, we need to stop the, the onrush of atheism and attacks against the faith, but we can't you know, deny evolution will look ridiculous. So they've accepted the principle that, oh no, God helped evolution. So, and, and, and of course, far it's beginning in the late 19th century and far more increasingly today. What's wrong with this view of a God-driven theistic evolution? Wouldn't that stop the atheistic consequences or the result that you had with the, the Nazis and the Soviets and the, and, and the, the, the Maoists? Well, the, the most important reason why attempting to combine evolution with the Catholic faith is disastrous is because of the consequences for the character of God. It basically results in making uh, evolution makes men into monsters and it turns God into a monster. But I want to just bracket that for a moment and explain why just in terms of the natural sciences trying to reconcile and theology trying to reconcile evolution with the Catholic faith is is disastrous you see if the molecules to man evolutionary hypothesis is valid as a scientific hypothesis it has to be able to stand on its own two feet it has to be able to explain what we actually observe in nature and in the laboratory. And we've already seen that it completely fails to do that. For example, in the area of genetics, what we see in nature in the laboratory is genomes breaking down and mutations destroying functional biological information. But evolution depends, biological evolution depends on mutations adding new functional information to the genome. So the problem is that what Catholic intellectuals are doing is they're recognizing that the evolutionary hypothesis as a scientific hypothesis is bankrupt. It's a failed proposition. But instead of saying, therefore, since what God revealed actually fits very well with what we observe in nature and in the laboratory. 
we should defend that. They don't do that. Instead, what they say is, God is the one who basically makes evolution work. And this is utterly perverse, because this, in effect, makes God the savior of evolution. And if there's one thing that I think is perfectly clear, is that our Lord Jesus Christ did not come down to earth to save evolution. He came to earth to save mankind. But what our theologians and most of our intellectuals are doing, not all of them, of course, but the majority is they are making God the savior of evolution. If evolution is made to stand on its own two feet as a scientific hypothesis, it will fail every single time. But once you bring God in to prop it up, well, then, of course, you're always going to be able to explain all the difficulties away simply by invoking God. This is what Teilhard de Chardin and his disciples have been doing for decades. But it is inexcusable because God gave us a revelation of what he did when he created the heavens and the earth, the seas and all they contain. And that revelation perfectly harmonizes with all the facts in every area of natural science. Who in his right mind would throw that revelation away and use and invoke God to save an utterly bankrupt and bogus bundle of speculation and conjecture. It's absolutely insane. In fact, I can't think of any better example of what Sister Lucia of Fatima described as the diabolical disorientation of our times. Indeed. On the other hand, however, many who subscribe to the theistic evolutionist view will say, well, this hasn't been decided. In fact, the popes have told us we can do this. Pope Pius XII, for example, in his encyclical Humanae Generis, they will say, allegedly teaches that as long as one accepts the divine origin of man, he can hold to evolution. And moreover, more recently, John Paul II formally said that evolution is a theory. We can call it a theory, and it's it's valid to, to look at it that way. So, so didn't he change the church's stance on evolution in that address to the Pontifical Academy of the Sciences? The, the reality is that there is not one single authoritative magisterial statement that tells Catholics that they can or should believe in evolution as an explanation for the origins of man and the universe. The first thing that people have to realize is that we have all been brainwashed to some extent by the evolutionary anti-culture in which we live. And one of the things that we've all been influenced by, whether we like it or not, is the idea of progress that we have progressed, that we know better than the people who went before, that we are smarter than the people who went before. And this is the first thing that we have to examine critically, because the reality is we are not smarter than the people went before, who went before. In terms of morality, in terms of understanding, in terms of wisdom, we have not progressed beyond those who went before. We have progressed in technology. We have progressed in certain areas of knowledge, no doubt. But when, when we speak of wisdom, when we speak of character, when we speak of intellectual acumen, there is absolutely no basis for arguing that we have surpassed our ancestors. In fact, the hard facts of genetics demonstrate that we are intellectually inferior to people who lived hundreds of years ago. There are articles that have appeared in peer-reviewed journals showing that, for example, uh, a certain test of um, visual reaction time, which is very strongly correlated with intelligence, which has been carried out since the end of the 19th century, shows a steady decline in the results. And this is explained 
as a result of the fact that as genetic mutations that affect the function of the brain as well as other parts of the body and other systems of the body continue to accumulate in the genome, we actually become less capable intellectually and physically than our ancestors. The reason why we live longer than our great-grandparents is not because we are genetically superior. It's because we have medicine and technology that artificially uh, prolongs our lives, but it is not because we are more fit. So let's dispose, first of all, of this myth that we are superior to our ancestors, that we know better, that they were primitive, foolish people, and that we shouldn't really take seriously the things that they said and the things that they believed. Now, in the Catholic Church, it's even less excusable for us to think that the most recent pronouncements of church leaders and theologians somehow trump all of the authoritative pronouncements of their predecessors, because it is very clear in Catholic theology that there is a hierarchy in the pronouncements that are made by popes and church leaders. And those pronouncements, which have been made at a very high level of authority in regard to a particular doctrine of faith or morals, are not automatically abrogated if a subsequent pope makes a statement on the same topic at a lower level of authority. Now, in case somebody is having difficulty making this distinction, let me give you a concrete example. I hope that most of the people who are listening to this program would agree that it is the traditional authoritative teaching of the Catholic Church as pronounced by all the popes, fathers, and doctors of the church from the time of the apostles, that the Catholic husband and father is the head of his wife and family, and that he is the spiritual leader of his wife and family. That teaching was summed up and reaffirmed by Pope Pius XI and Casti Canubi, the same encyclical, where he reaffirmed the Church's constant teaching on marriage and against birth control. So, it may be of interest to our listeners to know that in the Catholic Catechism of 1994, there is not one single mention of this very important doctrine of the headship of the Catholic husband and father in the Catholic family. So, my question for everyone to consider is this. Does the fact that the Catechism of the Catholic Church makes no mention of the leadership role established by God for the Catholic husband and father in the Catholic family, does this mean that this is no longer a doctrine of the faith? Does this mean that the Church no longer teaches that the Catholic husband and father is ordained by God to be the leader, especially the spiritual leader of his wife and children? Of course not. It would be utterly insane to assert any such thing. But let me take it a step further. It's very well known that Pope St. John Paul II wrote about the mutual submission of spouses in marriage. So, what would we say to somebody who claims that because the Catechism of the Catholic Church makes no mention of God ordaining the Catholic husband and father to be the head of his wife and family, and Pope St. John Paul II says that spouses should practice mutual submission, doesn't that mean that this is just a, an old-fashioned, culturally conditioned notion about the husband and father being the head of the family, and that what we really need is to move on, evolve, if you will, into a more enlightened understanding where the husband and father isn't really the head, but he's just the co-head 
with his wife. Two heads, after all, being better than one. Well, I think, I would hope that most, if not all, of the people listening to this program would immediately see the necessity of pointing out that it is not possible to abrogate 2,000, almost 2,000 years of authoritative teaching based on a pronouncement of a pope that was made at a lower level of authority than the, the teaching already possessed prior to his pronouncement. And so rather than taking the teaching of mutual submission as the sum total of the church's current teaching, authoritative teaching on the relationship between husband and wife in the family, the proper Catholic way to proceed would be to take Pope St. John Paul II's statement on mutual submission and reconcile it with almost 2,000 years of Catholic tradition. Only then could we say that Pope St. John Paul II's teaching on mutual submission has been rightly understood. And by the way, it's perfectly possible to do that reconciliation, but only if you have the proper respect and reverence for the traditional teaching of the church. How do you do it? Very simple. You simply recognize that the Catholic husband and father is called to submit himself to the needs, not the wants, but the needs, especially the spiritual needs of his wife and children. But the wife and the children are to submit themselves to the authority of the Catholic husband and father. That is how you reconcile Pope St. John Paul II's mutual submission doctrine with the traditional doctrine of the church on the role of husband and wife in the family. But you see, that's not how many theologians operate today. Instead, they take the most recent pronouncement of a pope or sometimes um, a bishop or a theologian, and they simply throw aside the prior almost 2,000 years of Catholic teaching and say, it's only this most recent pronouncement that matters. We've progressed. This other traditional teaching, it's, it's finished. We don't, we're not concerned about that anymore. And this is completely false, and it is a recipe for the destruction of the faith. Especially when you, <clears throat> when you add to that that a, a catechism is not in and of itself infallible. It's, uh, it's a compendium of teachings, and those teachings therein contained are only as infallible as their source. And Correct. so, and, and then likewise too with John Paul II in that document, he doesn't explicitly deny that the you know the husband is the the spiritual and authoritative head of the family, and so that you could read that easily as because Saint Paul uses that expression himself that he's talking about charity because there has to be a mutual submission and charity in marriage in order for a marriage to be a really holy and chaste wedlock. So certainly that could be reconciled in that way. But you're right that most theologians they, they're, they're, today grasp at whatever they can, such as you see in the, the most recent Synod Relatio. Now you have bishops like Bishop Lynch in Florida picking up from this non-authoritative document written by uh, Bruno Forte, who I've previously written about on this website, and you know this attempt to, to say that uh, unnatural marriage you know, the same-sex marriage. It has these spiritual benefits somehow, again, again, against the clear witness of Scripture and tradition, what the Church has always and everywhere believed. But, so now when we talk about authoritative sources, however, then we move on to Genesis, theistic evolutionists will say, well, that has to be understood in an allegorical fashion. We can't take Genesis chapters 1 and chapter 2 literally. We, we don't know what the genre was that the, the author was using. You know, it, it just seems more logical that this is all symbolic. You know, it, isn't that what the church teaches, especially given the Pontifical Biblical Commission under St. Pius X, to, you know, said that, you know, the, the, this could not be denied, that there's a, there's a genre that we don't understand and there's some allegorical uses here. Well, first of all, let's 
answer that question in relation to Humani Generous first. I don't know how many times we have been told by well-intentioned Catholics that Humani Generous, paragraph 36, allows Catholics to believe in theistic evolution. But no matter how well-intentioned the person who says this, the claim is completely false. You can look through Humani Generis from beginning to end, you will not find one single place where Pope Pius XII permits anybody in the Catholic Church to believe or teach theistic evolution. It isn't there. In fact, in Humani Generis, he specifically tells the bishops that they must teach that all of Genesis 1 to 11 is true history. Paragraph 36 simply exhorts Catholic experts in theology and natural science to examine the evidence for and against the evolutionary hypothesis. And permission to examine and discuss in no way equates to approval of what is being discussed. Just as in 1958, when Pope John XXIII formed the Birth Control Commission, and then Paul, Paul VI expanded it, permission was given to experts to examine the pros and cons of birth control. But none of that could be equated, even though the mass media and many Catholic intellectuals did equate it to approval of what was being discussed. And exactly the same error has been made with regard to Humani Generis. Now, whoever wrote Pope St. John Paul II's speech, which, by the way, was never actually given in 1996 to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, claimed that Humani Generis gave some kind of approval that it didn't actually give. But that's an error. And anybody can easily verify for himself that it is an error. It's a factual error. There is no place in Humani Generis that gives permission for theistic evolution to be believed or taught by Catholics. So the problem with Humani Generis is that the Pope wasn't obeyed. Catholic theologians and natural science didn't do what he asked them to do. They did not make a balanced examination of the evidence for and against the evolutionary hypothesis. If they had, we wouldn't have theistic evolution being taught in Catholic institutions. Because every time that evolution in its theistic or atheistic form is subjected to close examination, it's rejected because it doesn't stand up to the test of scrutiny. But because the Pope wasn't obeyed, only the evidence, the alleged evidence for evolution has generally been seriously considered in Catholic universities and research centers. I can literally count on one hand the number of Catholic universities and research centers that have actually obeyed the Pope and provided a forum for world-class Catholic scholars who make the overwhelming case against evolution. But there have been literally thousands, probably tens of thousands of conferences in Catholic universities and research centers all over the world making the case for theistic evolution. In the Darwin year, the Pontifical Academy of Sciences wouldn't allow one single critique of evolution to be presented at their conference on evolution. Is it any wonder that the recent popes have been led to believe that the scientific evidence actually supports, to some degree at least, the molecules to man evolutionary hypothesis? No, it's, it's no wonder at all. The wonder is that in spite of all of the one-sided, disobedient presentation of the evidence to the church leaders, there hasn't been one single authoritative magisterial teaching telling Catholics that they are free to believe or to teach in it, teach it. That is certainly a miracle of God. But the simple reality is 
all of the authoritative magisterial teaching in the history of the Catholic Church is on the side of the traditional doctrine. And there is no authoritative magisterial teaching on the side of theistic evolution. But there's something else that we need to really underscore. I've mentioned it before, but I need to mention it again. The reason why we have all this confusion about the church's teaching on origins is because church leaders are not drawing the boundary between theology and the natural sciences where it has been traditionally drawn. All the fathers, doctors, popes, and council fathers in their authoritative teaching understood that the work of creation was a fiat creation. Just read your Roman catechism from the Catechism of Trent. It's very clearly set forth. And it was only when that work of creation was finished that the natural order, the order of providence, as many doctors call it, began. Therefore, it was not lawful or appropriate or fruitful for natural scientists to attempt to extrapolate from the present order of nature to explain how everything came to be, which, remember, is what Descartes said we should do after getting his visit from the angel of truth, after dabbling in the occult. So, once we draw the boundaries between natural science and theology where it ought to be drawn, where St. Thomas and all the fathers and doctors drew it, all the confusion disappears. Because as soon as we do that, we realize that the so-called science of evolution isn't science at all. It has nothing to do with natural science. It is bad philosophy disguised as natural science. And then we will be able to evaluate the philosophical and theological claims of the evolutionists with the tools of theology and philosophy instead of being intimidated to accept as natural science what is actually bad theology and bad philosophy. Having said that, let's address the question of the genre of Genesis 1 to 11. Mm. The magisterium has been very clear on this point. We have two ecumenical councils, Trent and Vatican I, which defined that when all the fathers of the church agree on any doctrine of faith or morals, uh, on any interpretation of scripture that pertains to a doctrine of faith or morals, that is definitive. And they're held up to us as the foremost expositors of holy scripture. So we have to face the fact that all the fathers, without exception, including St. Augustine, regarded Genesis 1 to 11 as a sacred history. That is why the Catechism of Trent refers to Genesis as the sacred history of Genesis. When the Pontifical Biblical Commission was an arm of the magisterium and descent from its rulings was considered, was, was deemed by Pope St. Pius X a serious sin, the PBC ruled in 1909 that Genesis was true history, Genesis 1 to 3. And Pope Pius XII in Humani Generis, the last authoritative magisterial teaching on this topic, also tells the bishops, you must hold that all of Genesis 1 to 11 is true history. So no matter what theologians may say, and no matter what Father Raymond Brown or heads of the Pontifical Biblical Commission after it was no longer an arm of the magisterium might say, the genre of Genesis 1 to 11 has already been determined, and that genre is history. Therefore, if Genesis 1 to 11 is history, any interpretation that denies the historical truth of what is related by Moses in those 11 chapters is false. And that's all there is to it. And also with the fathers, I guess it's important to put it in, in context that they're not merely just, again, quoting the scriptures and saying this is true. They're also responding in defense of 
a parallel view in the ancient world, which was the ancient Greek view, which was the, the pagan Greek view that was opposed to the Catholic faith. And they said, well, arguments very similar to evolution. You had the atomists, you had all different uh, philosophers that, that drew from pre-Socratics and from Aristotle and others to try to argue for a different view of creation than what Christians were explaining. And it was the science of the day to to argue against it based on something that came out of Gnosticism or some other things. So the fathers were actually reacting to an error denying creation. They weren't just merely um, you know, quoting each other. This was an important thing that had to be defended. Absolutely. The reality is that the intellectual elite of the first Christian centuries believed in long ages and believed in evolution in many cases and uh, all different kinds of materialistic explanations for the origins of man in the universe. So this idea that Darwin was some kind of original genius is, is just nonsense. The fathers of the church had to go against the mainstream of their time to defend the truth, the literal historical truth of Genesis 1 to 11. And they were mocked and ridiculed for believing as literal historical truth this book that was put together by these Hebrews who had no standing in the Greco-Roman world, and yet they wouldn't budge. You can look at any of the fathers and they held fast. They would not budge. And when it came to the age of the universe, for example, they understood that God had given to us in the sacred history of Genesis sufficient information to know that the entire universe was not more than 7,500 years old, this being only reason it not being completely certain exactly how old the world was had to do with the fact that the numbers in the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text of the Old Testament, were different from the numbers in the Septuagint Greek text of the Old Testament. But all the fathers held, including Origen, that based on the scriptures, the creation, the entire universe, was much less than 10,000 years old, and there's absolutely no exception to that. But they held to that position in the face of the Greco-Roman intellectual elite mocking them because that scriptural testimony went against the thinking of the time, the scientific thinking of the time. Mm. Now, with regard to the historicity of Genesis, you were when you were here, when I first heard you speak here at um, Coeur d'Alene, which is adjacent to where I live in Idaho, the, um, you had said, well, why, you know, if evolution was true, why wouldn't God just simply, you know, explain it to Moses and explain it to the ancient Hebrews? I mean, because the argument that they're too simplistic is really a non-starter is after all, we teach this to our children in elementary school. So, and then they learn it and they imbibe it and then they grow up believing it. So why would it be hard, you know, this? Now there's a response to that argument, which is that in Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 through 33, our blessed Lord said that you see the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. Now, this statement taken absolutely is actually false. The seeds of an orchid are far smaller, even dust-like, and, you know, but they didn't exist in Israel. So just as we say that God could have told the Israelites about evolution, if that's how it really worked, couldn't someone say, well, why didn't Jesus mention orchids? Well, of course, they're two very different things. Um, in the first place, the origins of man in the universe is something that is of fundamental importance to every human being. So it had great relevance to the people of Jesus' time and the people of every time. And it was absolutely essential that he communicate the truth to all people on that topic. When he was talking about the mustard seed, he was using a poetic form of speech. And he was using a figure of speech where in common parlance, nobody would be expected to be uh, scientifically accurate in the way that the critics are expecting him to be. 
I mean, we have the the the, the song. He, the wonderful man on the flying trapeze, he flies through the air with the greatest of ease. Does that mean that the man on the trapeze was at greater ease than anybody in the universe at that moment? I don't think so. It's just a figure of speech which communicates that this man is, is so calm and so relaxed as he does this incredible acrobatic feat. Well, it's no different. Jesus is talking to his audience and he says the smallest of seeds. It's, it's, a, it's an expression to communicate very effectively, by the way, that you take something very, very small, and by the power of God, it grows into this enormous tree. So for the purpose that he had when he was speaking to that particular audience, it was completely apt, fitting. Um, so I don't think that it's a fair objection at all. When we're talking about the difference between special creation, fiat creation, and evolution, we're talking about something that is, first of all, um, we're talking about two different accounts of origins that are diametrically opposed to each other, and we're talking about two different accounts of origins which have profound consequences not only for man's understanding of himself, but even more importantly, for his understanding of God. So to hold that God would have allowed his people to believe something completely false about their origins and the way they were created is nothing short of blasphemous. Excellent. And so now we're drawing, uh, we've got to draw this to a close. Um, I'm sure the listeners will excuse the length. It's been an absolutely fantastic interview, which I thank you for. It's just packed with fact after fact and amazing information. But so the last point is that those still clinging to theistic evolution will say those Catholics still doing this as well as uh, Protestants who do the same. They'll say, well, wait a minute. The, the, this is, you know, all right, fine. You, you have your little points on this, but this isn't important today. What's important is abortion and, and birth control. Listen to the Catholic side. And in homosexuality, the Supreme Court's about to rule on gay marriage, and this is going to have consequences for everyone. Why are you worried about evolution? I, I mean, can't we, I mean, what's, what difference does it make? We're talking about moral issues here, right? And so, so aren't you just you know, harping, beating a dead horse and flogging an issue that's not really important for us today. Well, the, the devil is very happy to see us running around and being concerned about anything except the most important thing. Um, if he can't get us to do evil, then at least he'll try to keep us from focusing on the most important things that will advance the kingdom of God. And the reality is, the true doctrine of creation is the foundation of our faith, and the doctrine of evolution is the foundation of the anti-culture of death. So, until we Catholics attack the foundation of the anti-culture of death, we're just con don't going to continue losing ground in the culture war. But I want to emphasize something very important. The most important reason why we must expose the errors of evolution and embrace and defend the traditional teaching of the church on creation is because of the character of God. In this whole debate, there is a tendency on all sides to forget the most important thing, the most important one, that is our God, the character of God. St. Thomas in the Summa Contra Gentiles summed up very beautifully the truth that it is a serious error to hold that it doesn't matter what you believe about creation as long as you have a correct opinion about a God. Because St. Thomas says an error about creation is reflected in an error about God. And what, what we need to understand and help others to understand is that what we understand about creation determines the character of God as we understand it. And so if we don't understand creation correctly, we don't understand God correctly. 
And our relationship with him is going to be distorted and in some cases damaged and destroyed. The reality is the God of creation, the true God, is a totally different being from the so-called God of evolution. The God of creation is the all-knowing, all-loving, all-wise creator who spoke into existence a perfectly beautiful, complete, and harmonious world for us in our first parents. A world that was completely free, not only from human death, but from deformity, disease, genetic mutations, birth defects, all these things. And when we destroyed the harmony of the first created world with our sin, he came down into the misery that we made, took it all upon himself, suffered torture and death, rose again and founded the Holy Church so that those who are baptized into Christ could become his collaborators in the church, restoring everything back to the beauty that it had in the beginning and bringing it to an even more beautiful fulfillment. That's the true God. And that's the true gospel of the Catholic faith. Who wouldn't fall in love with the true God? But you see, the God of evolution, little g, is a totally different being. This God, little g, of evolution uses 550 million years of death, destruction, deformity, and disease to evolve the bodies of the first human beings. And when he finally gets around, like a priest friend of mine says, like a mad scientist, to evolving the bodies of Adam and Eve and the wombs of subhuman primates, he brings them into a world that he himself, the god little g of evolution, has filled with death, destruction, and disease. But that's not all. The god of evolution, little g, also allowed his holy church to teach authoritatively an account of origins that is completely different from theistic evolution. And then he arranged for the leaders of his own church to be enlightened, not by saints and scholars within the Catholic church, but by godless scientists like Hutton, Lyle, Darwin, and Huxley, most of whom hated the Catholic Church and wanted to destroy her. And then when, when the God of evolution had used godless scientists to enlighten church leaders, he then inspired the church leaders to inform the faithful that it was the godless scientists who were correct and that it was the fathers, doctors, popes, and council fathers who went before them who were mistaken about the fundamental question of the origins of man in the universe. Young people are not stupid. According to the organization FOCUS, we're at the point where only 15% of Catholic young people continue to practice the faith minimally when they go away to college in this country. Because young people are not fools. If we teach them that evolution is true, they can see that God permitted his church to teach with great authority a totally different account of the origins of man and the universe for almost 2,000 years, which is still on the books. They're going to draw the obvious inference. It's obviously the godless scientists who are the ones who know what they're talking about. So why would they stay in the Catholic Church when, the, when it seems like even the people who represent the church are telling them, that the church leadership had to be enlightened by godless scientists to understand how to interpret 
their own scriptures correctly. No, young people are not stupid. They are leaving the church in droves because what they are being taught in most of their schools and universities is utter nonsense and contradiction. But there's good news. I have been on five continents and I've met wonderful Catholic young people on five continents and every single Catholic young person that I have met who believes in the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation and who knows that the real science supports that beautiful doctrine is a vibrant, courageous, marvelous example of a Catholic saint in the making. So the reality is, my friends, we could turn the whole situation around in a few years. And we would do it very simply like this. Stop teaching the evolution nonsense except to show what the world is thinking and to show why it's wrong. That is important. Teach the young people from the time that they are babies the truth that God revealed and that was believed and taught by all the fathers, doctors, popes, and council fathers about creation. And in just a few years, we would have a complete restoration of the faith in this country and throughout the world through the prayers of the Mother of God, of St. Joseph, and all the holy angels and saints. May it happen soon. Amen. And like so many things, though, it requires going against the tide. As G.K. Chesterton said, a dead thing goes along with the flow. Only a living thing can go against it. And like in so many other things, on uh, life issues and uh, other issues of uh, Catholic teaching, it requires going against the grain of modern science as well as modern theologians and even sadly many churchmen so but i thank you for your time and this has been you know absolutely impressive uh, discussion at every level what are some resources where people can find out more about you and the colby center both online and maybe in print um, we have a website www.colbaycenter.org and on the colby website we have many many free resources i encourage people to just browse we have a lot of free downloads and then we do have a web store with um a variety of of books and dvds um, if people are looking for a a very good comprehensive overview of this whole subject from a catholic perspective i would highly recommend john wins um, uh, a Catholic Assessment of Evolution Theory. It's really, really an excellent book. We also have um, The Doctrines of Genesis 1 to 11 by Father Victor Walkowitz and many, many, many other uh, excellent works. So I encourage people to visit the website uh, to browse and um, to um, avail themselves of that information. And if they're are questions that arise especially about any of the topics in natural science we have a wonderful advisory council made up of catholic theologians philosophers and natural scientists in in just about every area of natural science and if people will get in touch with me through the website i'll be more than happy to answer their questions or put them in touch with people who can and if there's anybody out there who would be able to organize a seminar in your parish or even a, a talk in your local Catholic school uh, or homeschooling community, I would really encourage you to do it. These seminars really change people's lives and especially if the young people can hear a coherent defense of the traditional doctrine of creation, it can totally change their lives and make the difference between their keeping the faith and losing the faith. So if you want information about that, we have some information on the website. You can also contact me directly. All right. Thank you very much, Hugh Owen. Thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate it. Thank you. God bless. Bye-bye. God bless.